There is no way that I thought those towers would ever fall. The fuel, it just melted the steel. Why did the Twin Towers crumble the way they did? How did they remain standing for so long? The project was designed for the impact, not the fire load. We envisioned uh, a 707 landing or taking off from JFK or whatever. Not, a, not an airplane with a throttle down. Now, more than a million tons of debris must be cleared. We go in, we look at an area, we try to determine whether or not we think it's safe to enter. There are still extensive fires burning under the site, so if you've got firemen or anybody around that area working, they could, in fact, be badly burned by a, a sudden flare-up. And it's little bits at a time. It's searching on your hands and knees. It's moving a foot at a time. It's baby steps. You're about to go to ground zero. That's our skyline now. Instead of the buildings being there, they're here. It's nuts. MSNBC investigates out of the rubble. If you ever had a chance to visit the World Trade Center, you know it was an awesome feat of engineering, where 40,000 workers hustled and bustled on just 16 acres. Now, just outside Ground Zero, a new community is hard at work, where thousands face the devastating loss every day, the place where nearly 5,000 were killed on September 11. As they clear this site and search for clues about what went wrong, they're also looking for ways to make buildings of the future even safer. December 23rd, 1970. One of the proudest moments in New York City history. The topping out ceremony for the North Tower of the World Trade Center. September 11, 2001. The North Tower is the first hit in the terrorist attack on New York. More than 8 million square feet of office space will plunge to the ground in an avalanche of steel, glass, and concrete. The falling wreckage pushes through the seven stories beneath street level into the New York City subway system. What took seven years to build takes less than two hours to come crashing down. The Twin Towers, once the world's tallest buildings, become the world's biggest pile of debris. It's a lot of trucks, 24 hours a day, seven days a week. See the crane with the, uh, the basket? That big piece of metal in there is a staircase. That's where they're flying a lot of people and a lot of firemen. They were all coming down the stairs when it collapsed. Each day, hundreds of workers and volunteers remove about 10,000 tons from the million-ton pile of wreckage with more to come. Leslie Robertson was the structural engineer when the Twin Towers were built. Everything will have to be leveled. There will be nothing left except some of the below-grade construction will, will be left. But um, all of that which people think of when they say World Trade Center, all of those buildings, uh, all seven of them will be gone completely. Removing all the wreckage from the seven buildings that made up the World Trade Center is expected to take at least a year. Finishing Ken Holden is the city's commissioner for design and construction. We're pretty much on the, on the year schedule, a year from September. Uh, our goal is basically to get down to street level by the end of the year, or by January. And then from January through September, we'll focus on the basement areas. Richard Tomasetti's structural engineering firm was commissioned by the city to assess the damage and to assist in removing the debris. We wound up putting cranes where cranes were never meant to go. The plaza is designed just for people walking on it, and we put a 600-ton crane there by developing a big steel grillage spanning between columns. There's a bridge in one area that's a combination of new structure and old structure to get cranes in certain areas. Some of them have been actually uh, uh, built using the wreckage steel from the World Trade Center. My father was in this business, and um, when I was a kid, he took me down here on a, uh, a smaller crane. 
And I remember looking up at the towers being built at the time. I was like six, seven, eight years old, and I, I knew then that this is what I wanted to do. And it's so hard to sit here looking at this mess. It, it really is a tragedy. But this massive excavation project is not just taking place above ground. Guy Tazzoli was the director of the Port Authority of New York and New Jersey when it built the World Trade Center. The towers are actually 117 floors high, so seven stories below the ground. You had the shopping centers, you had all the below-grade space, because a city within a city needs below-grade space for all the services that you, you have for such a city. And much of those seven stories below the towers, including the subway system, have collapsed and are filled with tons of debris. New York transit officials have determined that more than a mile of subway lines, including some stations, will have to be rebuilt. This section of tunnel right under us here is fine, but if you head north, it's flat for most of the way uh, through the plaza area there. Just north of that, you've got Seven World Trade, which collapsed on our tunnel, so we've got another collapsed section up there. Also below the surface is a three-foot-thick steel-reinforced concrete wall that descends about 75 feet to bedrock. Called the bathtub, the wall surrounds the 16-acre site. It was originally built to combat the pressures of the Hudson River and the Atlantic Ocean, pushing inland. Though the bathtub wasn't breached in the collapse, it is now being supported by rubble. Well, it's almost like a garbage compactor. It's all pressed down in there, so it's keeping that wall in place. But someone will have to figure a way to buttress that wall up so it doesn't cave in as they take the debris out of the bus. But before the wall can be supported, there are still hundreds of tons of twisted metal and concrete that have to be removed, sometimes by hand. The main thing is to clean everything out. Clean everything out but also gently, so you don't know what you're, what you're going to find inside. I stay pretty busy here. I'm tired. I'm extremely tired. Seven, seven days a week, 12 hours a day. It takes a lot out of the person. I've got to get up at 4 o'clock in the morning to get here. Among the workers and volunteers who routinely put in 12-hour shifts, exhaustion is only one of the problems they face. Hundreds of firemen have been tested for respiratory problems and nearly a thousand injuries and illnesses were reported during the first week and a half of the operation alone. Men and women who were working out there are walking on very uncertain ground. I and mean, if you're standing next to a steel beam that goes over on its side and you're gonna have broken legs, you know, it's not, it's a very unsafe place to work. But the men and women who toil at Ground Zero every day know this is more than just another job site. To many, it's become holy ground. I become very emotional when I talk about it, knowing that all these people are in here. Then I had three, three friends that I knew personally that are in there, so it's kind of rough for me. Still ahead. When the World Trade Center was designed, which was really uh, in the late 1960s, it could truly be said that it was state-of-the-art or beyond state-of-the-art. It was a truly, uh, true uh, engineering marvel of its time. Since September 11th, engineers from around the country have been examining the rubble at Ground Zero trying to determine what caused the Twin Towers to come crashing down. Was it the impact of the jets, the resulting fire, or something else? But to understand why they collapsed, it's necessary to understand how they were built. In the early 60s, Lower Manhattan was in the midst of a deep financial depression. Aside from Wall Street, there was little commercial success on the southern tip of the island. The time was ripe for a renaissance. There was not a single new building had been built in Lower Manhattan except for the Chase Manhattan building since World War II. The area was dying. Uh, it was a dead village after 3 o'clock when the stock exchange closed. The planning and designing of the World Trade Center would take six years with construction for the seven buildings beginning in 1966. 
fact, the Reader's Digest called this project when we announced it in 1964 the largest building project since the pyramid. The World Trade Center was built to stand out. The memo given by the chief of staff of the Port Authority to the architect was build a building that will be noticed. And it was noticed. And it was designed to be noticed. It was there to be noticed. But before any construction could begin above ground, the site had to be excavated to bedrock, more than seven stories beneath the surface. A three-foot concrete retaining wall had to be built around the 16-acre site. Once the retaining wall was built surrounding the site, construction of the Twin Towers could begin. We made columns, which is a wonderful structural system, very close together columns, very stiff structure, very redundant structure, able to do that which the structure did do, which was to stand there with an enormous number of the columns removed. Eventually, the towers would rise at an incredible three floors every 10 days, and when completed, would stretch a quarter mile into the New York sky. The towers would briefly hold the title of the world's tallest buildings, and until September 11, 2001, they were the largest commercial space on the planet. When the World Trade Center was designed, which was really uh, in the late 1960s, it could truly be said that it was state-of-the-art or beyond state-of-the-art. It was a truly, uh, true uh, engineering marvel of its time. One of the innovations was making the external walls the primary support for the towers. These outer columns, tied closer together than was normal at the time, could withstand the impact of a Boeing 707. Though the plane would destroy some of the columns, the building would still remain standing. One thing I've learned about World Trade Center is that the construction of this structure was almost perfect. There's no construction flaws I've seen. Everything was just done so right, so good. It's just genius design. Though the towers were considered an engineering phenomenon by architects and engineers, they were not widely accepted by the public. It is very poorly designed for work conditions because you do have so many people packed into a small place. The word might be inhuman, definitely sterile, aesthetically nothing. The towers were considered ugly, sterile rectangles with few redeeming qualities. They could never hope to be as revered as the city's other skyline icons, the Chrysler Building and the Empire State Building. That is, until 1993, when a terrorist bomb failed to bring the towers down. The World Trade Center was really adopted by New Yorkers after the 1993 bomb. It really became part of people's uh, sympathetic and empathetic imagination when it was wounded but remained standing. We could then see it, if not as a beloved architectural icon, as certainly as a symbol of ourselves and our resistance and our resilience. But where the terrorists failed to bring down the towers in 1993, others, in a way beyond belief and comprehension, would succeed. On September 11th, a large jetliner uh, traveling at high speed ran into the World Trade Center. And from the impact and then the weakening of the building due to the fire, uh, they collapsed. Guy Tazzoli witnessed the horror while on the way to his office on the 77th floor of the North Tower. And I saw that second plane flying at full speed, and it was horrible. It just disappeared inside the building for a few seconds, and then there's a great ball of flame. And the first reaction I had was, my God, the poor people above when I saw that fire that came around. And I was sad, and I confessed, I cried. I sat in my car and cried. And what had been part of his life for the last 40 years came crashing to the ground. There is no way that I felt those towers would ever fall and collapse the way they did. Just not possible. And yet they did. Why? Because the fuel, it just melted the steel. And once it collapsed those floors between the elevator core and the outside wall, the building imploded. When the airplane struck, the North Tower, it removed about two-thirds of the columns on the north face of the tower. And similarly, uh, when the plane came in from the south, it removed 
approximately two-thirds of the columns on the south face of the tower. But what else happened? The engines from those airplanes went into the building, removing structures that went through. Undoubtedly, many of the inner columns inside of the services core around elevators and stairs and so forth were destroyed. The South Tower remained standing for 56 minutes after impact. Its collapse took 10 seconds. The North Tower, the first hit, stood for 102 minutes after impact. Look, 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 look. It collapsed to the ground in eight seconds. Oh, my goodness. Dr. Hassan Astane, a professor of structural engineering at the University of California, Berkeley, is examining the causes for the collapse. The fires weakened the columns of these buildings. When the columns here buckle, this portion dropped on top of this portion. So imagine a 20-story building dropped on top of a 90-story building. And the other one, a 30-story building dropped on an 80-story building. It kind of hammered everything down and everything went down. But the fact that they remain standing for as long as they did is a lasting legacy to the tower's design and construction. Nobody designed these buildings in the, in the early and mid-60s for to withstand what they withstood. You know, we lost 5,000 or 6,000 people, but you know, we, we saved a lot more. And the fact that these buildings stayed up as long as they did under the devastating assault that they took, I think is, uh, is testament to the great job that the engineers did and the contractors did when they, when they, when they built these buildings. Even when you see the work going on at Ground Zero, it's hard to imagine how immense the cleanup project really is. When we come back, we'll go thousands of feet into the air to show you cutting-edge technology being used to monitor the fires in the rubble and keep workers safe. This, this is actually an infrared image of the ground as we're passing over it. This is the fire seen right in here. These glowing hot spots. You actually see some of the water jets. There's Building 7. It's 6.30 a.m. Larry Scott is flying in a Navajo chieftain at 130 knots and 8,000 feet. His destination, ground zero at the southern tip of Manhattan. This is actually an infrared image of the ground as we're passing over it. Using the latest in laser and heat imaging technology, his mission is to help ensure the safety and efficiency of recovery efforts at ground zero. the uh, precise line navigation and you can see as he lines these you bring these two indicators into coincidence he's within literally a few feet of a predetermined track this is the uh the camera it's all primed and ready to go the video is recording engage the laser recording uh, this is ground zero these are the two federal buildings the communication building this is over here number seven just went out of sight I've seen it so many times, I just looked for a couple of key buildings. This is the fire seen right in here, these glowing hot spots. You actually see some of the water jets. There's building seven. Scott's mission has three vital components. He collects digital pictures to help plan the removal of debris. He maps the site with a device called LIDAR, a sophisticated laser that digitally defines the buildings in rubble heat and he records thermal video, a crucial guide to determining the location of ongoing fire. Scott is a technician with Earth Data, a cutting edge firm working closely with the New York State Office for Technology. There are still extensive fires burning under the site and what we're able to do each day when we fly is, is um, monitor the change in those fires. So if you've got firemen or anybody around that area working, they could in fact be badly burned by a, a sudden flare up. The LIDAR is the most sophisticated tool for pinpointing potential danger spots. It's the laser scanner, and it, it has an infrared pulsing laser and a scanning mirror and actually measures the topography of the ground. And it's, it's very high speed. It, it collects like 900,000 points a minute, and the points are just samples of the ground, which goes into making topographic maps. The result of this hyper-fast laser 
is a map revealing the heights and movement of remaining buildings and rubble piles. We're also monitoring the rubble pile each day to see if there is actually, as I said earlier, co uh, condensing uh, rubble or if rubble's moving in any particular direction. But what we have found out is that the rubble pile is pretty stable. Earth data must interpret the LIDAR so that it looks like a skyline and not just so many digital points. So they create colorized maps. This is data that's actually been extracted from the tapes that you saw being brought in and loaded onto the computers. And what we have here is a, a sequence um, of information about the what's now known as Ground Zero. This imagery here was taken a year earlier. As you can see clearly here, the Twin Towers are here. And obviously the Twin Towers are completely gone. But you can see here the rubble piles. And you can see here, these are the spikes of what's left of the uh, the Northern Tower and some of them of the uh, hotel, etc., that used to be here as well, the, the, the Marriott Hotel. To make better use of this data, excavation workers also need a good, clear picture of the site. These images are, are being used to try and give people a, an overview of the site. Once you're there at the site and you see the magnitude of the devastation, it's really hard to orient yourself. These images that we took on the, on the first day's flight, you can actually see uh, extensive um, uh, smoke uh, emitting from, the, from this site. The crystal clear photos are then married to Earth Data's images from the heat-seeking camera. The fire department gets this information. They decide where they're going to play their hoses onto the fire to try and and keep it to a minimum. If you look right here again, you can see an actual fire hose stream coming out onto this area right here. That's that white stream. And you can see that uh, between the 16th and the 17th that this fire has moved back a little bit, which was the whole plan. The progression from the first day of shooting, September 16th, shown here in red, is remarkable. That's the 16th to the 28th. There's still, you know, obviously hot spots there. What is it like today? Maybe we need to go a little bit further. Today's the orange, the very beginning to today. today. Hopefully, the crisis has been averted. For the people at Earth Data, their satisfaction knowing that good information and precise planning have played a vital role at Ground Zero. Well, there's not been a life loss that I know of on the site since the recovery program started due to somebody either falling into um, a void or uh, being burned by a flare-up of a fire. So. Um, we, as a, as a team here, get great satisfaction out of the fact that we feel that what we're giving them is keeping people out of harm's way and potential additional loss of life. Still ahead. We're averaging between five and 6,000 tons a day uh, between the two sites. And the amount of this stuff, and I know you've been looking at, see, look at that, that four-inch thick steel that just twisted up like a pretzel. What's interesting, too, though, is that these bolts didn't fail. This was ripped out, but structurally, she held together. That's a testament to the people who built it. Work at Ground Zero can at times be overwhelming. Of course, it's the place where nearly 5,000 people lost their lives. And now crews are working hard to clear the immense amount of debris. But one of the biggest challenges is what to do with the nearly 2 billion pounds of rubble. I've been on a lot of big projects. This is different. I mean, I don't think the city of New York has ever seen anything like this. Or the world of engineering, for that matter. Companies like Weeks Marine are working overtime on one of the biggest excavation projects in history. Currently in the, pro in the, in the project we have uh, about uh, 90 personnel, um, over 30 barges, uh, four loading cranes, and about three tugboats uh, being used to transport the debris and the steel. Workers at Ground Zero move piles of rubble into dump trucks. The trucks haul the debris and steel to Weeks Marine at two waterfront sites in Lower Manhattan. Cranes capable of moving more than 50 tons a load get the debris onto the barges. We're averaging between five and 6,000 tons a day 
uh, between the two sites. Marty Corcoran is the operation manager. He arrived on site soon after the attack. I guess this is what war looks like. I don't know. It's hard to explain. I've never seen anything quite like it in my life. Once the refuse is on the barges, it is sent to locations around New York Harbor. Captain Scott Murray runs a small tug, perfect for the tight fit of New York Harbor. This is a 62-foot, 1,000-horsepower tugboat. Uh, you know, it's real good for this type of work that we're doing with these smaller scows, harbor work. Murray has been in this line of work for 25 years, but this job hits home. One of the things I've always loved about working in New York Harbor is working around Lower Manhattan here in the East River and this view of Lower Manhattan and the skyline. So now, every time I look over there and see that without the World Trade Center in it, it's like being kicked in the stomach. Today, Murray is making runs across the East River. Pier 6 in Brooklyn is a staging point. Murray drops off one full barge here, picks up an empty one, and returns to Manhattan for more loads. From there, the full barges are toted off to Fresh Kills Landfill and recycling plants in New Jersey. And the amount of this stuff, and I know you've been looking at, see, look at that. That's four-inch thick steel that is just twisted up like a pretzel. One of the drop-off points is the Hugo New Schnitzer East processing plant in Jersey City. General Manager Bob Kelman says they're taking in about 3,000 tons a day. There's two different types of material coming in. Some of it is kind of a mixed light iron material, a lot of building interiors, uh, ductwork, um, paneling type material, metal paneling. Um, and the balance is the original heavy beams that came off the World Trade Center site from, I believe, about September right after the attack on the 11th to about the 19th of September. The operation is working around the clock to handle up to 110 trucks and four barges a day. Once offloaded, the steel is cut up into smaller pieces using massive shears, so-called guillotines, and high-powered acetylene torches. We're basically trying to cut it into segments. It's going to be manageable. But because the material, it's so thick and so heavy, they'll cut cross-section on top, then we'll flip the whole piece over and cut the bottom. The method is just to get it super hot and you're blowing air, using fuel and oxygen to get it hot and molten. Then you blow air to actually blow the molten steel down below. And you start cutting it, it's like cutting like a knife. You have to get it to that critical melt point and then you can keep blowing. It's the only way you can cut this. Only way. The beams are cut into two to three foot blocks for easier transport and ultimately melting down. The material is going uh, anywhere from China and the balance of Southeast Asia, Malaysia, uh, Taiwan, Singapore. It's going through the best available market at any given time. The scrapyard has become a scientific laboratory of sorts. Engineers from around the country have come here to examine the steel and learn more about why the Twin Towers collapsed. Dr. Hassan Astane brought samples back to the University of California, Berkeley. What happened here was actually the, the engine go, went in and took a chunk from the side of the column. In this picture, you see the piece, a section of the airplane actually struck what we're looking at here, and it's exampled by the, the way that the material, the steel, is almost cut like a knife. The steel is flared in, it's kind of sliced like butter, and according to the professor, and it seems to bear, um, you know, hold up, that what we're looking at is something that was hit at a very high velocity by something very hard. And after engine went through it and cut this piece, the column was standing, or the rest of it. Astane has developed his own classifications for the massive amounts of steel coming out of ground zero. One is critical. These critical members are those that were hit with the plane. And I found perhaps four of them. Like this one. It was part of one of the larger uh, rectangular box columns. And, and what I understand is that these were part of the internal supports of the building up near the elevator shaft. So uh, this is deep inside the building. What we have here is another example pointed out by the professor of what he believes indicates a massive impact. 
uh, by either a part of the fuselage or perhaps you know part of the body of the air airplane itself or an engine. The second category is important members, beams that heat it up and buckle. This is one of the beams that uh, obviously took a lot of heat damage and actually started to melt because it burned right through to the burn hole and it actually kind of collapsed onto itself and uh, clearly due to the heat and it's significantly corroded and melted and the back side of it is gone intense heat that they've been talking about the you know 1500 1500 degrees to 2000 degrees the third category valuable members consist simply of beams twisted and mangled by the collapse and finally pieces that don't need to be studied and can be recycled immediately yet even they tell stories what's interesting too though is that these bolts didn't fail this was ripped out but structurally she held together from all indications we're seeing a lot of bolts that are in place and uh that's testament to the people who built it for Kelman and his crew, the long hours and the nature of the work have taken their toll. That's our skyline now. <clears throat> For 30 years, we knew it from this facility with the Twin Towers as part of the battery and, you know, Statue of Liberty. And instead of the buildings being there, they're here. It's nuts. Just ahead, a rare glimpse inside these crumbled buildings. We'll take a tour of Building 5, where some firefighters spent the first few weeks searching for survivors there. What we're looking at here is some of the, uh, the less damaged area of this whole one and two World Trade Center complex, isn't it? It is because you could see openings. You could see daylight. You could see areas through beams. There are areas across the plaza that it's, it's just solid all the way through. And maybe you'll see a hole that's as wide as my shoulders, and that's about it. September 11, 10.05 a.m., the South Tower of the World Trade Center collapses. Move it, come on! 10.28 a.m., the North Tower falls. Some eight hours later, Building 7 crumbles. But the destruction wrought by the hijacked jets goes far beyond the buildings that collapsed. Richard Tomasetti's engineering firm is at ground zero every day assessing the damage for the city of New York. Well, the World Trade Center buildings, uh, the uh, North Tower, the South Tower, and the uh, hotel, and the World Trade Center number seven uh, are totally down. And then the uh, numbers four, five, and six are uh, severely damaged, partially collapsed, uh, uh, with a lot of major damage in the portions that are not collapsed, uh, all of which will have to be um, uh, demolished. Building 5, for instance, sits northeast of where the Twin Towers stood, a black nine-story structure that housed 36 companies. What? To see why it has to be demolished, all you have to do is look inside. This for a reference point, would have been the plaza. Just plaza days area. after the attack, MSNBC's Ashley Banfield got an exclusive first-hand look inside Building 5. If you can see down on the right-hand side, you can see handprints along the wall. Yeah. You can actually see that the wall is bowed out. What are those handprints from? That would be because they lost all electric power in here. The people are going to grab, you always grab a wall, and you follow the wall to the end. See. If you know you, where you're going, you're going to hold the wall, until you come to the doorway. You're in pitch black. We have the ceiling, which has been pushed up, which means this wall is moved. We don't know how stable or unstable it is on the other side of this wall. This is where, if you went out onto the other side, the, uh, there's a globe of the world there. And opposite from here, the antenna is still standing, which slid down off the top of the roof of uh, building number one. Who is in here? What is all this, that debris this outside? Is, this is all part of the uh, superstructure of the building, all of the drywall and, and uh, the offices from above. The red columns are from building one or two. That's the steel work from those buildings. This debris here looks as if it came from this building because 
most of the steel work has a distinct pattern to it. Across the way, that's number one. This is building one over here. This Straight is what's, what's left over. What's left of it. You can see. Yeah, just stay right here. This we don't know. We got a chandelier here. Yeah. Straight out. That's the back end of the building. Technically speaking, what we're looking at here is some of the uh, the less damaged area of this whole one and two world trade center complex, isn't it? It is because you could see openings, you could see daylight, you could see areas through beams. There are areas across the plaza that it's it's just solid all the way through. And maybe you'll see a hole that's as wide as my shoulders, and that's about it. Is this one of the first areas you came down to try to get low into the debris to see what you could? Yep. So as you can see out in this way here, it's got debris that's falling through. Right here on this corner, if we made the right turn, that takes you down, all the way down into the entrance of building number one and then you would make a left off into building number two. How far are we walking in this concourse right now from where building one and two would have been? How many minutes would it take me to walk from here to building one and two's concourse if I were... Uh... At a nice pace? Yeah. Probably about five minutes. Okay, this area here, off to the left, is an entrance for New York City's uh, subway system, the A and the E train. The gentleman had his uh, newsstand over here. The debris wall that you see over there that's another entrance that would have been out on vc street coming in through the lobby of building five you could have made the right hand turn go down the escalator long set of escalators down to the path system continue a little bit past there make another right hand turn and that would take you into the entrances of buildings one and two even the buildings that will survive suffered severe damage the american express building roughly 400 feet to the west of the towers looked like a war zone inside just five days after the attack. Virtually no building in Lower Manhattan escaped untouched. Along with the gray-colored buildings, which are gone, and the red ones to be demolished, those in blue had major structural damage. But the damaged buildings in gold are sound, and all of those in beige required cleaning. Once the buildings are repaired, they will be as good good as no. There's absolutely no residual damage. But at ground zero, the real damage is not hidden in the structures of its buildings. It is seen up close in the skeletal remains of what once stood as a symbol of pride for all of New York. If you're looking at it as a construction site and you're just removing debris, it's great. You know, you're, you're zipping through the project. But if you look at it as still thousands of people that haven't been found, it's horrible. Still ahead. New York is about skyscrapers. It's about high residential towers. That's the, that's the guts of the city. That's the essence of this city. We're going to rebuild. We're not only going to rebuild, we're going to come out of this stronger than we were before. While the World Trade Center has become hallowed ground for Americans, it is also a working laboratory for structural engineers, architects, and forensic scientists, all studying the wreckage and the attack for clues about the future of skyscrapers. New York is about skyscrapers. It's about high residential towers. That's the, that's the guts of the city. That's the essence of this city. Before September 11th, there was only one other time in history when an aircraft hit a New York skyscraper. In 1945, a B-25 bomber lost in the fog slammed into the 78th and 79th floors of the Empire State Building. The 102-story queen of the New York City skyline absorbed the hit and suffered minimal damage. But that plane only weighed 10 tons. The World Trade Center towers were attacked with approximately 185 tons of aircraft, carrying 75 tons of jet fuel. Though the structures seemed to withstand the impact, the explosions and the subsequent heat from the burning jet fuel were beyond its limits. The nearly 2,000 degree temperature would eventually take its toll, weakening the infrastructure, and in less than two hours, reducing the twin towers to a memory. Even with all of that, the buildings were able to last for an hour, almost two hours in one case. And that's in part because of the nature of the structural system. It's what we call redundant. That redundancy 
did cause the portions above where the planes hit to stay up in one building about an hour, another building more than an hour and a half. And the good news is, is 15 to 20,000 people escaped from those buildings. 15 to 20,000 people escaped to those buildings. So uh, it was, um, I was delighted that they at least stayed up that, that, that stay up that long. But despite the extraordinary strength of the towers, September 11th has caused Americans to rethink nearly everything in their lives, including the safety of buildings in which they work and live. At his Berkeley lab, Professor Astane is studying new methods of wall construction that would provide better protection from an air attack. First, we should make sure that the plane does not collapse the building, the impact. Second thing is we should make sure that the plane does not get inside as, as easily, as fast as it did. So it does not deliver the whole fuel into the building. And in order to do that, we are trying to develop like this kind of wall that, that is a composite wall of steel and concrete, and that might prevent that kind of uh, getting plane into the building that easily. But even with improvements, can skyscrapers ever be built to make us feel safe? You know, I could probably wear a, a vest that will always protect me if you throw a baseball at me. Now, once I've solved that problem, I have to start looking at what What's the next projectile that you're going to throw? Throw at me. You can improve a building and improve its behavior for terrorist types of attacks, such as explosions. I don't know if you can design a city that can never be damaged from a bombing raid. It's not the kind of building that we want to live and work in. We're talking now about building real forts. They're not buildings anymore. I mean, they're devices designed to resist airplanes, which is a different different animal. I don't think that's what we want in our lives. By all estimates, the debris at ground zero will take a year or more to clear. But the debate for the future of the 16-acre site has already begun. We're going to rebuild. We're not only going to rebuild, we're going to come out of this stronger than we were before. We have to rebuild. And they'll put a group together and you know, maybe I'll be part of it, I hope. But I know from my association, that people all over the world are still playing in Shanghai and other places in China. They're still talking about buildings 1,500 feet high. To New Yorkers, the tall buildings are essential to the landscape, part necessity and part pride. If cities have a personality like you and I do, and I think they do have a personality, certainly New York does, uh, it is not only the ability to welcome people from all over the world, but it's the ability to get off the mat and get up again and and we not be afraid. And if, you're, if you want a gracious, easy life, this never was a good place for you. Before September 11th, a quarter million people passed through the World Trade Center every day. Now it's limited to the hundreds involved in the cleanup. 46 days after the attack, they were joined by thousands of mourners. This gave them an opportunity to see it in a more spiritual atmosphere and, uh, and quite frankly, from a different perspective, We're looking at maybe a fifth of building four, which is still standing, the rest of building four is gone, and kind of looking out behind you at, the, at some of the, the destroyed facades and kind of sit there and hear the music and listen to the, the, the words that were being uh, spoken uh, in that atmosphere, I know was stirring for everybody. Each person sees something different in the rubble of the World Trade Center. But for the families of the lost, it's where dreams died and a new national resolve was born. A poll taken just a few weeks after the World Trade Center attacks showed that two-thirds of New Yorkers think that the World Trade Center should be rebuilt. What form it will take and what memorial it will include are still up for debate. That's our program. Thanks for watching. I'm John Siegenthaler. For continuing coverage, go to our website at msnbc.com.